All right. So did we get right to a tuition? A tuition? Did we get to a tuition? Yes. All right. And then what battle did 7,000 men go down in 20 minutes? Yeah. And where was the bloody angle? What battle? Spotsylvania. Spotsylvania. Good. All right. So attrition kills so many of the enemy. There's Grant. And this is where Grant came up with one more plan. And it's a good plan. But it fits in with this kind of attrition thing. Now it's kind of starve him out. He can't. He knows he's probably not going to be able to win a victory. And what he did is this. He ordered, here's Cold Harbor. Here's Richmond. He ordered Meade to advance here and fake an attack, but send most of his army across the James River and attack, and this is what you got to get down, Petersburg. Petersburg. Petersburg was an important railway junction. If they can capture Petersburg, the Union Army could starve out the Confederates, force them to evacuate Richmond, and then attack them while they're retreating. Yeah. Who did you say was going? Me. So the Army of the Potomac. Now, it worked perfectly, at least at first. At least at first. Starting about June 12th, you don't need to know the date, just, but June. They faked here, Lee dug trenches, exactly like before. But men, the U.S. Army engineers built the longest pontoon bridge they'd ever built, a mile long, right here. They built it, poured men across, and came to the Petersburg lines. The problem was the same general who led at Spotsylvania, it was his corps that led the march to Petersburg. Meade ordered him to attack immediately. But when Baldy Smith, the corps commander, got there, this is what he saw. These are Confederate trenches. Now, this is actually after the battle, or after the siege of Petersburg, but these went on all the way around the city. Slaves had been building these for three years because the Confederates knew how important Petersburg was. And there's something else. You don't need to write this down. I just I put the name down so you see. I can name them as Cheval de Free. Pre Barbar. Barbar is still 15 years away. It's about this high, you put these stakes into these poles, and, well, perfect defense, isn't it? This might shock you, but people don't like to be impaled on stakes. Yeah, I know, is that weird? You know, you learn something new every day. But what a great defensive line then. If you put those in certain spots, you know, here and then here, and leave an opening, men will funnel to that opening, and then you put cannon there with canister. Targeted right in that spot. In World, War, World War One, they would do that with barbed wire. Well, Baldy Smith saw that, and his first thought was cold heart, and he hesitated. When Meade got there that night on the 16th, Meade was furious, could not believe he didn't attack, and he ordered an attack the next morning. As we, as the North knew now, there were virtually no Confederates. There were less than 3,000 Confederates in the line, and most of them were what they called invalids. They had been wounded in a battle and couldn't campaign anymore. They were stomach soldiers. They had severe intestinal disorders. They're under the command of Beauregard, the same Beauregard that's kind of floats throughout the whole war, but they could have taken it. Smith outnumbered them three to one. Didn't attack. What happened that night for when Meade ordered to attack the next morning and then sun up? What happened that night? We arrived with most of his men, and it was a slaughter. They couldn't take it. And that pretty much ended that offensive. A month of unbelievable casualties. They couldn't take Petersburg, and it turned into a siege. And the siege would go on. Yeah. What was the guy's name? You don't need to know. Just know they didn't attack. His name was Baldy Smith. Okay. The siege would go on for nine months. From June of 64 to April of 65. Nine months. The Union Army wasn't big enough to totally surround it, so they could just cut off a little bit of the supply line. The Confederates weren't strong enough to push them back, and they stayed there for months. A precursor to World War I. Both sides dug even more elaborate trenches. The trenches got deeper and deeper because if you showed your head, a sniper would pick you off. Some areas of trench were as close as 40 feet apart. Some areas a mile apart. But it would become just like World War I. Just like it. And the trenches went all the way from Richmond to the main line of Petersburg. And it just stayed there. 
There would be some attacks between the lines, but no one could break through. There would be attacks for nothing more than a raiding party. And if anybody, or at night, sometimes they would, uh, men would crawl out, either to get wounded men or bring them back, or to scout on the enemy. But if you were caught in between the trenches, in between the trenches, the trenches, the trenches, and it's dead, you're dead. At Petersburg, they gave a name to the area between the trenches. Do you know? Yeah, no man's land. People think that's a little one, but the first time I used it was Petersburg. Horrific fighting. But the big thing was, for the most part, you get little bits, tiny little, little, uh, just little, tiny little uh, periods of terror and awful fighting, but mostly awful boredom. You're just sitting here, can't stick your head up, you're just looking up. And they would play games, they would gamble, but for the most part, just be miserable. You can imagine the Virginia summer, hotter than half winter, it rains all winter. If it rains in a trench, it's, yeah. We'll talk more about trench foot, but yeah, we get trench foot. And trench foot is basically when you're, it's a, it's a fungus that gets in when you're, when the skin quits circulating. You know, when you take a bath and it wrinkles. When it wrinkles, that means water's getting in there and blood doesn't circulate. We just imagine that for two weeks. The skin begins to die and makes you susceptible to a fungus that's everywhere. And it begins to, your foot literally rots away. It's bad. No, it really hurts. Stories of guys taking their shoes off and the foot coming with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not bad. But then think about other little things. I mean, there's dead bodies and dead horses everywhere. Where are the latrines? The what? The bathrooms, the latrines. Oh. They dig a hole, right? But if it rains, you flood. Yeah, just awful. Well, here's a couple pictures of that. Here's an engraving from Harper's, so it shows them trying to stay out of the heat. These are mortars to lock shelves, snipers. Here's another good one. It shows some of the activities both sides did. These are Confederates, and they would gamble, do all kinds of things, but one of their favorite games was put a hat on a bayonet, stick it up. <laughs> and they would bet on how many bullet holes would be in the hat. You see, like 30 seconds, how many bullet holes? That's what they're doing here. See the hole. Counting. So if you bet five, you win, you know, that kind of thing. How do you win? Or they would bet, yeah, they would gamble to pay or their food or something like that. And the thing was, you know, they just something that's past the time, but it's, you can imagine how, in a, in a way, too, it made it more frightening. You can easily envision your head being in that house. Well, after a month, it's stalemate. But a regiment from Pennsylvania who were hard rock miners meaning that they had been doing coal mining, a bunch of them. They came up with an idea that had been, it's as old as war in it. They tried it at Vicksburg. We can't go over the top. Let's dig a tunnel. Let's dig a tunnel under the line. And it's literally what it means is undermine their defenses. That's the term you ever heard, like a landmine. That's where it comes from, undermining their defenses. Let's dig a tunnel. Their core commander was Ambrose Burnside. Remember Burnside? He was given the command of a corps, and Burnside's like, try it, what the heck? And so they start to dig. And what they do is, here's a picture from that time, Union lines, Confederate lines. They dug the tunnel, when they went, they were about here, through the sand and clay, it was about a four feet by four foot wide tunnel for most of it, so pretty shallow. And they came up with a way to get air down the tunnel, because they couldn't have shafts, and the Confederates would be looking for that. Well, it looked like it might work. After about a week and a half of digging, they went really fast. And so Burnside went to Meade. Meade was overjoyed. And they said, let's do it. Let's do it. It's going to be July 17th, 1865. Let's do it. And the plan was this. First off, it had to be secret because Confederate spies everywhere. But they carried the dirt out at night from the tunnel and spread it all over so they wouldn't see an unusual amount of dirt piled up. Clever. And then they started rolling gunpowder. When they got into the Confederate line, the plan was to go 50 feet in each direction and then pack it full of barrels of gunpowder, 100 tons. <laughs> now, the original plan was going to be 30, but they kept having more room. They had more room than they thought. So they loaded it up. 
Gunpowder is not an explosive. It's not high explosive yet. That's still a couple years away. Alfred Nobel is about to invent dynamite. If you want to know where the Nobel Peace Prize came, he felt guilty. That's rough. That's why. But they thought since gunpowder doesn't have that big of an explosion, because it more just ignites, it would be like a shockwave. Maybe their line would collapse a little bit, but there would be a shockwave that would stun the Confederates and they would attack right there. And so they had it all planned. One other thing, it happens really fast. They did it at Vicksburg too. It happened in World War I. It was called live and let live. You know, if you didn't have to kill the enemy, why kill them? And so they would shell every morning. The Union Army would shell the Confederate lines, but they would shell at sunup. So the Confederates could be in their shelters. They called them bomb groups. They could hide under those. And they would shell. And then they would quit shelling, no shelling, for both sides to come out and cook breakfast. Make sense? So when you blow up the mine? At breakfast. At breakfast when they don't expect it. And so they had it all planned. And then a regiment, I'm sorry, a division of over 4,000 fresh, very determined troops had never fought, but they were desperate to prove they could fight under an abolition that's still written up here by the name of Ferraro from New York. It's also part of the temperance movement. Ferraro's division, determined to fight, what were they? What kind of soldiers? Well, yeah, they were black soldiers, well, almost all in former slaves, and they were determined to fight. The plan was they would crawl out in no man's land. They would lit at night. They would lay so they couldn't be seen as the sun just coming up in that first shower. Just lay. Then the mine would go off. There'd be a muffled explosion. They'd attack. But that night, just before they're going to blow the mine up, me changed his mind. He pulled Ferraro's division out, said, you're not going, you'll be the reserve, and put in a division that had been fighting since the wilderness, Pennsylvania, Cold Harbor, under a general by the name of Leadley. And that's what they did. Leadley was not told about the mine. Leadley was told, you're going to charge the Confederate lines at sunup. We're dead. The men crawled out thinking this is it. They knew. They remembered. They weren't even told. Leadley couldn't deal with it. Well, before we even leave, Meade pulled them out. Now, he'd been bitterly criticized, and he should be criticized for doing this, but people thought it was because he thought he believed black soldiers couldn't fight and they'd run away. And so he did it because he was racist. That's not the reason at all. There's a rumor going on all over the North, and it was kind of spread by the South. That the northern plan was to put black soldiers in uniform so then they could sacrifice and kill off the black men. Therefore, eventually, remember when I talked about that white republic that so many northerners wanted? That's what they'd have. And so he was worried if slaughter, he'd be accused of trying to murder black soldiers. That is simply wrong. It's a ridiculous idea, but that's what he was afraid of. So me pulled him out. Is that kind of weird how I got that dynamic going on? Yeah. So do we need to know like these names? I might ask for a bonus, that's it. All right. And so we need to know like, what happened. But you need to know what happened in the battle, yeah. So what happened was this. You know why they got pulled back? Uh, yeah, go ahead put that down. Let me thought that. I think that's a good thing to know. I, I, have a, I have one of the questions that I think that addresses that. Yeah, I'll fit in with that weird kind of racial dynamic that's going on with uh, the former slaves and that idea of a white republic and so many in the north sure they're all for free slaves but they certainly didn't want to coming up and taking their job sort of thing all right so these men crawled out Lee couldn't take it. he sat in one of the bomb groups and proceeded to drink as much whiskey as a human could put in his body just downing whiskey Lee was completely drunk. He was legless. That's an Australian term. Right? Drunk in that. So their commander wasn't even there. And so the English were shelling. Breakfast. They had long feuds. Now the thing was they tried an electric fuse, they tried it at Vicksburg, but it didn't work very well. So they had these long feuds. Just like with a little gunpowder and they would light like on firecracker fields. And they lit at the edge of the tunnel. So they lit it here, or lit it here, they had a little sandbag in place here, so in case something came shooting out of the tunnel, and it went down the tunnel, 
and right about here, you know what's going to happen. What happened? It sucked. The fuse went out because we're waiting, waiting. Uh oh, we need a relatively short, a fast, and crazy volunteer to go get a match, light it, and then gone. <laughs> and of course, there's always somebody, right? So a sergeant volunteered, and that's what he did. He went out there, lit the match, took off down, running full speed, like this. She's running full speed down the tunnel. I mean, he got right to the edge. Now, remember what they expected, a muffled explosion, kind of a shock wave, maybe some dirt coming out that side. And everyone's, personally, nobody knows what's going to happen. So they're eating breakfast, all both sides. What happened? A massive explosion. Just boom, and the entire Confederate line went up. Every part underneath that trench went flying up in the air. So we're talking all the dirt and wood, all their equipment, the people and horses. There weren't that many Confederates in the line. But still, gone, up in the air. Nobody expected this. And all over, men were totally knocked down, taken by surprise. Black powder, that must have been so loud. And stuff started falling on them. There were big pieces and dirt flying for miles around. Just, at, just where, near where that tunnel was, where the mine was, a Confederate squad in the second trench was cooking breakfast, and the slaves cooking their breakfast. Boom! There they go. Almost a mile away behind the Union line. Same kind of scene. They're cooking their breakfast around a campfire. Explosion hits. Stuff's falling on them, and the men look up, they see something kind of big. Oh, it's getting closer. It's getting closer. And their story was this. As they're sitting there watching, Alton landing right in the middle was... Just kind of landed, was it like? On his feet, just kind of like this, and looked at it. <laughs> they swear that happened. And of course, you can imagine, they're all like, ah! Then eventually, they, they decided, let's make some money off this, so they took him into a tent and charged a nickel to see the flying man. But that's what happened. The guy running out of the tunnel, he was just literally here. And then guys were yelling, run, and boom! And the blast wave shot him 100 feet. Just went boom, and he shot over and kind of skidded, followed by a big jet of fire. He got up and was fine. I'm <laughs> trying to figure that one out. Well, then you can imagine what Lee Lee's men did. Almost 2,000 men. They're not far away, they're stunned. And they get up and they just kind of stumble. And what did they find? A what? You said it. But they're sucking. Most Confederates, Confederates who were killed in the explosion were out of it. They found a massive crater, thus the name Battle of the Crater. This is a Harper's engraving of this. This huge hole, 30 feet deep, about 50 feet wide, about 100 feet across. From the explosion. Yeah, from the explosion. And they got to the edge of this crater and they kind of looked down. And what did they do? They went in. All of them went in. They just kind of charged into the tunnel or the crater. The problem was the sides were really sharp. And they got to the other end and they were having trouble to get out. A few got, a few got out, but they couldn't get out. And Confederates started breaking up. This is where you get to kind of fun, like, oh, a good chance. Good plan to a farce, to tragedy. They got to the edge. They started shooting in. They couldn't miss. And then the amazing thing happened. Ferraro's division was ordered to back up the attack, and they came charging over Noel's man, no man's land. Where was Ferraro? He wasn't there. Anybody want to take a guess? What's he the guy that lit the match? He was yeah. flying. He was trusted. He was a leader of the Chapman's division. He was in the same bomb proof as Leadley, trying to convince Leadley of the evils of drink. True story. That must have been one heck of a conversation. Does anybody want to guess who's going to be court-martialed after this little affair? Those two? Burnside's going to be fired. Don't see Burnside in, in battle. But, so Lee men, or Farrell's men, almost all of them charged into the top of the crater too. They're literally shoulder to shoulder. Some men went around. They went around, went around. they might have gotten a breakthrough. But instead, they all poured in. And by then, the Confederates were recovering. And they began to drag cannon. And in Kent, they propped up the cannon and started shooting canister into it. You couldn't miss. They could not miss with any shot. 
and eventually Burns had no choice but to pull them back. Now, it could have been worse looking at it, but there's still another 2,000 casualties on both sides. The crater is one of those great stores. It's a really amazing store, but it also shows almost the futility of this and how close it's become. It, good store. So you said 2,000 hmm? casualties? How about 2,000 casualties? Remember those killed, wounded, and missed. There were a lot of missing Confederates. It was what and it devolved into stalemate. Yeah. So, it was a major Is what? It was a major You could argue it was a southern victory because the, the Union attacked there. But it certainly was no like glorious victory. And the thing is about this after that, well, first off, the Confederates were going to have an ear to the ground for the rest of the war. We're looking out for tunnels, <laughs> trying to hear digging underneath. But Petersburg is stalemate. That's what you got to get. Petersburg is stalemate. And Petersburg is going to be stalemate for the rest of the war. Now remember, Lee didn't need to win. He just had to convince Northerners that they're not going to win and elect somebody else. Now I'm going to do this very fast. But in the West, remember General Sherman was going to take the West. Do you remember that? Sherman and his about 90,000 men. Facing him is Joseph E. Johnston. The same Johnston who took the mini ball on his hip, Lee replaced him, very good general. Johnston, brilliant defensive general. Men love him. He's in the mountains, but Sherman has advantages because he has more men, and unlike Meade and Grant, he can attack either direction. Yeah. So Meade and Grant are fighting. Petersburg. Yes, yeah, so they're fighting Lee, and then Johnson's fighting Sherman. Exactly. And Sherman's the Union. And I try to find a good map, but this one kind of does it. This was almost a bloodless campaign, at least compared to what's going on in Virginia. Here's Chattanooga. Johnson's right here, and what Johnson, or what Sherman does, and he does it four times, is he uses most of his men to attack here, and then sends about 30,000 men around. Johnston's line to cut off the supply line. Johnston, realizing it, pulls back. So he does it here, 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 and here. There'd be one sharp battle at Kennesaw Mountain, but that's about it. In a little bit over two months, Sherman maneuvered Johnston to the very gates of Richmond. So right, I just say Richmond, I meant uh, Atlanta. The problem was this. Johnston's army is still basically intact. Sherman is now there, but Sherman's army is not strong enough to simply just take Atlanta. Not only that, when he got to Atlanta, what they found blew them away. Slaves have been working there for three years. Look at these. A palisade is a little fortification. So cannon firing canister right here, and there are the Cheval de Free right here. And more Cheval de Free. Yeah. So did you push them back to uh, Gates of Atlanta? Gates of Atlanta. Uh, Gates of Atlanta. If I, I mean, I, I, Richmond came out right now. Now, going into August, it looks like stalemate there too. Stalemate Atlanta, stalemate of Richmond. The other attempts failed, and now everyone's talking election. The election of 1864, now this is not like a modern election. Your candidates were chosen at a convention. There was no real campaign as we know it. So in the summer is when they started talking about it. And by August, Lincoln knew he, knew he was in trouble. This is a prophetic picture. This is right after the Battle of Antietam, when Lincoln went to the Union camps. There he is, and who's that guy? Who's that? The commander at Antietam. Who? McClellan. Yeah. Oh, McClellan was a Democratic nominee for president. McClellan. The guy who created the Army of the Potomac. To be a being general? Yeah. He was bitter, yeah. And he was nominated president. Now McClellan said to everybody, I promise I'll finish the war. But no, 
No. If he's elected, they'll have no choice but to sue for peace. This is a referendum on the war. A vote for McClellan, Confederacy survives. And everybody knows it, regardless of what McClellan says and might even believe. And after this, after all the fighting and all the bloodshed, look like McClellan would win. This is a Republican cartoon right here. And it shows there's Lincoln and a working man. Working man was symbolized by paper hats. And Union and Liberty, if Lincoln wins. And look at the school. What do you notice about the school? It's what? It's integrated, yeah. Shows you how things have changed in the North. It went from the white republic to only a fight for union to a cartoon supporting Lincoln talking about integration. Equality is becoming the message. McClellan wins, who's that guy right there? Jefferson Davis, yes. Slavery, etc. Lincoln is a Republican, but they chose a party for one election. It's going to be called the Union Party. And it's going to be Abraham Lincoln, who's a Republican. But he's going to throw Hannibal Hamlin's not going to be the nominee for vice president. They chose a Democrat, Andrew Johnson. And they combined the two as the Union Party, meaning a fight for union. Johnson was a war Democrat. But not only that, you notice the state? He was a senator from Tennessee at secession, and he stayed loyal to the Union. He would become a territorial governor of Tennessee. The, I'm sorry, the military governor during the war. So the classic example of Union. Not only are, are we bringing a Republican and a Democrat together for Union, but a Northerner and a Southern for Union. Now, it's just for this election, the Union Party. But Lincoln, don't forget, he's a Republican. Johnson's a Democrat. So don't forget that. So right before the semester test, when you have to do, you have to go all the presidents uh, from Washington to Teddy Roosevelt in order at their parties. That'd be easy. 23 of them. Johnson is a Democrat. What's a Democrat? Lincoln's a Republican. Even though it looks like here is in the angry toad party. But yes, doesn't kind of look like a mean toad right there. Here's a Democratic cartoon. There's McClellan holding the country together as Lincoln and Davis pull it apart, which is a pretty disingenuous cartoon. Lincoln was so convinced that he was going to lose that he wrote a letter to have it ready after McClellan's victory. In fact, everyone thought Lincoln would lose. And in this letter, he wrote, essentially, so he wrote almost, this is pretty much verbatim, that Lincoln said, after your election, we together must do whatever it takes to win this war, because we both know after you're inaugurated, you'll have to end it. And he put it in an envelope, addressed it, and was ready to give it to President-elect McClellan, all ready to do it. It's about as dark a time as you can imagine for the country. Because yeah, the South is holding out, but food shortages, all, um, all the fighting and devastation in, their, in, in the South, and then the North, it looks like the country's over. Who's going to save the country? Who's going to step in and save the country? One man will save the country. Who? John C. Calhoun? He's dead. That's his grave. No Calhoun. Is he son? Raul? His brother Raul? He's made up. That's not a real person. <laughs> Notice the rain? Yes, he has neck hair. <laughs> Next week, dress up day. I'll give you extra credit. I'm adding one more person you can dress up as. Oh. Raul. So you John C. Calhoun, Ambrose Burnside. Who else? Fluoride. Fluoride. Or Raul Calhoun. One of them is not a real person. You like that? But yeah, for a green uniform, he got a little happy. Raul had a good life. It's Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis saved the Union. Why might 
that be ironic? Why might that be ironic? Because he's what? The president of the Confederacy saved the United States. Now, is it, Lincoln still might have been alive. We don't know. But what Davis did was he hated Johnson. Hated Johnson. Couldn't stand him. So he fired him. He fired Johnson because he thought Johnson wasn't aggressive enough and replaced Joseph E. Johnston with maybe the most aggressive general in the Confederate Army. And Lee told him, told, told Davis, don't do it. But he did it anyways with John Bell Hood. What a picture. He has that, has that sad eye look, doesn't he? But he shook. He lost a leg, I think, at the second bull run, and then an arm basically lost his, his arm at or fighting at Little Round Top at Gettysburg. He only knew one thing to attack. He took command. And what did he do? All through August, he counterattacked against Sherman's bigger arm. Three big battles you kind of lumped together as the Battle of Atlanta. Hood's men counterattacked. And what happened to Hood's army? He destroyed his own army. Almost half of his men were casualties, and he was forced to do what? What did Hood have to do at the end of the month? Surrender Atlanta. Yeah, he had to evacuate Atlanta. Exactly. He pulled his army out. Sherman took Atlanta. And when Atlanta fell, I can't even begin to describe it to you. Everything changed. Everything. All of a sudden, it went to stalemate and the war never ending to we've almost won. It's almost over. All we need is one more push. Literally, overnight, Atlanta, that victory there. So it's one of the great what ifs in history. What if Johnston could have held out for another month and a half or two months? Lincoln might have lost. And then one more city fell. Mobile, Alabama. Actually, the city didn't fall, but they fell. Do you remember the Battle of New Orleans I mentioned earlier? Do you remember that Admiral Farragut? Admiral Farragut, the same Farragut, now 65 years old, took his fleet into Mobile Bay, defeated a Confederate fleet, including an ironclad called the Tennessee. This is a famous painting. There's Farragut's flagship, the USS Hartford. There are the men fighting and the ironclad Tennessee, and they literally were so close that their hulls were bumping together as they fought. It was that close. Farragut, who is the admiral of the whole fleet, so he's not in command of the actual action, but he, he wanted to be seen. He's not hiding. Look where he was. He had himself tied to the riggings. So his arm is tied, and his leg is tied, so he got vertigo. So he's worried he would fall off. The Confederate ship was right along fire. That's what we call crazy courage. They blew past the Confederate forts and the Confederate guns. Mobile Bay fell. Victory. Huge victory. Now, Mobile might not be as big as Atlanta, but you combine the two, we can win this thing. Now, let me do this real fast then. What did that mean? Lincoln was elected. Lincoln was re-elected. And the election, okay, remember, obviously, those states in blue, they're not going to vote, but to finish this roll, I'm going to show you two things. First off, look at the vote number. McClellan got a lot of votes, didn't he? He's from New Jersey. That's okay. Electoral college is all that matters. Remember, the popular vote doesn't matter. It's the electoral college, and the votes voters are picking the electoral. electoral. Once this happened, North's going to win. Harper's Magazine did an engraving, and it's one of my favorite political cartoons of all time. Lincoln's already tall. Look how he is after the election. I love that cartoon. There is only election results. So, it's over. The South cannot win. They're not going to quit. So tomorrow, Appomattox Courthouse in the Washington, D.C., and Reconstruction, which is another tragedy. Almost oh, Oh, we should limbo. No, say that again. Yay. Yay.